And now I'd like to introduce Lawrence. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm Lawrence, I'm the Youth Forum Rep for Growing Confidence Project with the Shropshire Wildlife Trust, uh, FSC Preston Montford and a few other partners in Shropshire. And I'm also a Youth Forum Rep, uh, I'm also a Youth Rep on the Steering Group. And I'll be uh, your guide to dragonflies and damselflies this afternoon. So uh, the year, of course, we all know. Uh, yep, I am the, I think my title is Youth Forum Coordinator for Our Bright Future, um, and that's about it really. I work for the National Youth Agency, um, but you've probably heard the spiel before, so I will pass on to Lauren, if that's okay. And I should ask that, uh, could uh, people say uh, what brings them here today, and oh. uh, what do they already, what's their knowledge of dragonflies and damselflies? That's a very good point. So um, I have always seen dragonflies, um, you know, just in May or in June um, and in the summer months, she says, um, and have always pointed out the blue ones, literally not knowing what they're called, um, how long they live for, anything about their cycle, but just knowing <laughs> blue <laughs> dragonfly. Um, and that's literally my knowledge. So zero actually absolutely zero okay so um, uh, lauren yeah um i'm called lauren i'm representing the saint margot's project putting their roots um i don't know anything about um dragonflies i nearly said butterflies which shows how limited information i know um i don't think i've ever even seen one so i live in london and we're not very like world lifey <laughs> so yeah, I've got absolutely no knowledge, but I'm very happy to learn. Excellent. I did just look up. Um, site, I did just look up before um, coming on some uh, some sites uh, local to you, so I'll let you know what they are. Uh, Olivia, um, I again very very limited knowledge. Um, I have a few photos that I'll show to you later. If you said to bring a photo, um, but so. I probably couldn't say what they were. I know I know there's like the main ones that I know is like the blue one and the red one. <laughs> well that's that, about it. That's where most people start. start. So um without further ado I shall uh, gracefully slip over to come on computer. There we go some photos. So um, Theodon, Theodonata, which is better known to the rest of us as dragonflies and damselflies. I put a little bit of Latin into this, but I focused on, uh, on pretty pictures. So um, this is the, well, obviously they are beautiful animals and this is a particularly beautiful example, in my opinion, but uh, they are, let's not forget that they are um, very effective predators and they have been very successful. They, this was one of the, uh, this basic body plan is one of, one of the first that insects ever developed when they uh, first appeared on earth and uh, the earliest examples of something like, of something that looks like this are a little over 300 million years old which is uh, about, 50, about 50 million years older than the oldest dinosaur. Now um, and some of them one of the very first ones did get very, very big. Um, this uh, example on the left is, um, quote, well, according to Wikipedia, from the Museum of Toulouse. And um, according to them, uh, this has got no scale, I'm afraid, but, according, but, they, but it has got a, a 47 centimetre wingspan, which is pretty much 10 times the size of the largest living dragonfly and makes it about the same size as that uh, model on the right. Now um, there's a little bit of um, debate as to what allowed the early dragonflies to get that big. The largest um, had a 61 centimetre wingspan which is really quite an impressive insect. That's bigger than a lot of seagulls. But uh, it's what allowed them to get this because probably a combination of uh, increased levels of oxygen in the atmosphere which uh, is one of the things that severely limits insect size today uh, because of the way that they breathe but also another big factor was may well have been the fact that there were no other flying animals there were no flying reptiles there were no birds 
that uh, these days uh, the the presence of birds both as a predator and as a competitor for food are a severe limit on, on the size of dragonflies. Nevertheless, um, the first uh, recognizably modern dragonflies uh, appear about the same time as the dinosaurs after these giants, just after these giants disappear. Um, and even in the very early days of modern dragonflies, most of the modern groups already existed. So um, dragonflies and damselflies clearly hit on a very uh, effective body plan and effective design for hunting other flying animals very early on and have never really left it. Now dragonflies have moved with the times and changed a bit but broadly they have always looked something like this uh, and uh, this is just an opportunity to point out the differences between dragonflies and damselflies. So Dragonflies on the whole, uh, there's quite a lot of information on these diagrams, um, which like most of the images I'm sure I've got on this, these slides are uh, from the British Dragonfly Society website, which is an excellent resource. Now, don't worry over much about the um, details on these uh, that have been labelled on these photographs. Um, simply to say, other than to say that like all insects, dragonflies and damselflies have got essentially three parts to the body. Uh, they've got a head, a thorax which carries the limbs and uh, the wings, so six legs as with all insects, and this abdomen which is most of the length of the body in dragonflies and damselflies and in dragonflies and damselflies has always got ten segments and uh, the patterns on these segments on the abdomen are usually the best ways of separating species that are quite similar. Uh, the other thing that these um, photographs show quite well um, is, well, one apart from the fact that, that uh, dragonflies are generally rather more heavily built insects than damselflies, damselflies are generally quite dainty and slower flyers actually, is that, uh, well, two other good distinguishing features. One is that with dragonflies, the eyes almost always touch on the head. They're, um, they're very rarely separate. Uh, in damselflies, they're much further separated, they're much further apart, and the eyes are sort of positioned on the left and right side of the head. On this damselfly, I'm hoping you can all see where, what I'm indicating with the cursor. Um, on the left side of the head, there's one large eye on the left side of the head, and you can't quite see it as well, but there's another large eye on the right side of the head. The other thing that this image illustrates quite well is a reasonably good rule of thumb for uh, telling apart dragonflies and damselflies when they're perched, which is that most dragonflies when perched sit with their wings outstretched and open. Damselflies when they're perched, most species tend typically sit with their wings closed over their backs, um, which is um, partly because in, or part, partly because uh, dragonflies front and rear pairs of wings are slightly different shapes, but damselflies, all four wings are more or less the same shape so they can fold them back on themselves very neatly. Um, so this is um, what we imagine them looking like and this is how we see them as they emerge which they will do which they are right now beginning to emerge but this is not how they spend most of their lives. They uh, in fact spend most of their lives not as adults like this. These are usually going on the wing for a few weeks in the summer. For most of their lives they look more like this. Um, now these are the nymphs, the uh, young that uh, grew up underwater. Um, in some ways it's more accurate to think of dragonflies as, and damselflies as creatures of uh, ponds and stream beds than as creatures of the air because many dragonflies, and many of them spend two or three years like this and only three or four weeks on the wing as adults. Um, and they go through um, a process that um, called incomplete metamorphosis, one of the one of three different uh, types of maturing that insects can go through. Uh, in this case what that essentially means is that the um, 
it, the lava looks like the adult basically you can sort of just about see the resemblance this i believe is a uh, is a hawker dragonfly nymph between this and the adult here in that it's fairly heavily built you can sort of distinguish the same three main body parts but there are some crucial differences obviously the nymph lives underwater it needs to breathe, it needs to breathe oxygen from water so it has gills um, and it has a slightly different way of the carnivores like the adults but they have a slightly different way of catching their prey um, with the adults the legs are specialized to form a basket underneath that they use to scoop their prey out of the, out of the sky um, the nymphs have got this um, appendage underneath the head called a labium which uh, is sort of raptorial appendage like the front legs of a praying mantis and it uh, shoots out and grabs what uh, the the prey animal and drags it back into the mouth uh, this is um it's almost like a case of the beast turning into the beauty lawrence yeah could you spell what you just called that um the, what the, the, la uh, the laddie or whatever it was labium yeah, yeah. Um, l a b yeah. I U M. Ah, perfect. Thank you. No problem. Um, so, another little general rule of thumb, although there are a lot, bear in mind there are lots of exceptions to this. Dragonflies, to a gr large extent, prefer to breed, most species breed in still water, ponds, or lakes. A lot of damselflies breed in flowing water, um, well-vegetated streams and uh, small rivers, that sort of thing. Um, and consequently, damselflies are sort of streamlined against a current in a way that dragonflies don't tend to be. So, moving on from, uh, so these are, so in most cases, the, um, female will lay her eggs directly into the water or sometimes onto vegetation in the water. Uh, the young will emerge and uh, spend quite some period of time as, this cre as these creatures steadily growing and will then ultimately, and if you look um, online you'll be able to find some wonderful videos of this, will then climb up out of the water onto a plant stem typically and uh, shed this uh, outer skin and turn into the flying animal that we all think of. Um, once it's uh, dried out and it's ready to fly, it will then have somewhere between three and five weeks in most species to find a mate, lay its eggs, and then uh, sadly it will expire, but not before uh, preparing the next generation of, uh, of dragonflies and not for the next generation. Now um, for a few, uh, now for a, I thought I'd include some images of a few uh, fairly common species that will be starting to emerge right now. Now uh, one that's quite common down near, um, on the River Severn near where, I, near where I live and I'm sort of eagerly anticipating coming out is this, although that's not how I imagine it, not how most people imagine it. This is the, uh, the nymph that, um, right, that right now there'll be many of uh, down in the river near me, uh, feeding on smaller creatures. I imagine it like this. This is uh, an animal called Calopteryx splendens, the banded damoiselle. Now, um, the demoiselles are uh, the largest damselflies that we have in Britain. They are, um, as um, there are only two species that we have breeding in this country, and uh, the banded demoiselle is the commonest around me. But it's uh, and uh, this is on the right is a male. Uh, incidentally, the uh, photos of uh, adult of uh, adult dragonflies and damselflies that I've included here are all of males. Uh, the reason I've done that is that when I first started learning 12 months ago, I was told to spend the first year just concentrating on the males because 
the females, particularly with species that are quite closely related and are similar in size, tend to look very, very similar and can be quite variable. Whereas the males tend to be very constant in terms of their colours and very different in different species. And this is a, a good example of that. Uh, the banded, uh, so the banded demoiselle is a large insect, quite a large insect. So it's Wingspan is something on the order of 40 millimetres. Yeah, up to 36 millimetres. And has, um, and the males have this dark band, dark blue band on their wings. Now, there's a very similar species that's quite common, also quite common in southern Britain. Uh, around the same areas that this is, called the beautiful demoiselle. Now, the, male, the, the, now the males are quite easy, are easy enough to tell apart because in the beautiful demoiselle, the whole wing is this colour. But females look, but female banded demoiselles and beautiful demoiselles look pretty much exactly the same. One's got, um, they, they're just, um, uh, they're, a wonderful, they're a beautiful bronze colour and their wings are slightly tinted and it's, there's only some very fine details of their anatomy that tell them apart. So that's why I would um, suggest concentrating on the males to start off with. Now this is another uh, damselfly that is uh, quite abundant across most of Britain south of, uh, sort of the southern highlands of Scotland. Uh, this is the azure or sometimes azure blue damselfly. Uh, this is one of a number of quite similar species of blue damselfly. Uh, unlike many them, unlike the demoiselles that uh, prefer rivers, uh, this is a little more common around ponds. Um, now part of the reason I've used um, these photographs, quite unusual photographs of, uh, a dam of damselflies sitting with their wings slightly open, is that it uh, makes clear the abdomen which is very very useful in trying to separate quite similar damselfly species. Uh, in this case, it's, uh, in, all, in uh, most cases, it's this second segment here, just, the, uh, just behind the thorax, second segment of the abdomen, that's pretty key in telling apart blue damselflies. In the case of the azure damselfly, it's got this U shape. Other, um, other species, the males have got slightly different shapes on that second segment. So, for example, in the common blue damselfly, it looks almost like a club shape, or maybe like a spade, if you think about the, uh, the card suit spades. Um, this, and this is what, this is, um, in, some, in some cases, it's um, very, very abundant. This is a very abundant, this species is very abundant, and the uh, common blue, virtually absent. Other near identical ponds nearby, or seemingly identical ponds nearby, will be uh, heavily populated with common blues and have very few azure blues, and it's never too clear why. And briefly, uh, the large red damselfly is very, very abundant and very widespread, um, and quite easily recognisable because it's one of only two largely red damselflies that breed in Britain. The other is the small red, which uh, is very much a specialist of acid heathlands and so you don't tend to see it in many other places but uh, large red is very widespread. Now onto a couple of dragonflies. This is a dragonfly that I grew to love last summer which is the southern hawker Aisha cyania. It's uh, actually quite easy to mistake for an emperor dragonfly. I did at first but it's got uh, emperor's uh, a much more uniform in colour than this and a slightly larger. Uh, this is a species of well vegetated ponds. It's quite a large dragonfly. Its uh, hind wing is uh, approaching five centimetres, the wingspan of its hind wings. And uh, it's um, reasonably easy to distinguish from some of its closest relatives like the, uh, like the common hawker. Uh, on the basis of the, again, the patterning of the abdomen. Uh, in this case, it's this pattern of green and blue patches, and they're very obvious on this side view. 
um, that distinguish it. The common orca is rather has got a different patterning of blue and green in the male again. Uh, the female southern hawker, uh, a lot of the, well, a lot of what is blue on the male here is green on her as well. And another, uh, just one and one last dragonfly, a very uh, widespread dragonfly, a um, considerably smaller dragonfly is the common darter. Um, this is one of a couple of red darter species that are uh, reasonably easy to tell apart on the colour of their legs. Um, with the common, uh, the common data having uh, white patches on its legs. The other similar species which, with which they're sometimes confused, and I haven't got to, I could find an image of for you, is the ruddy data, which has got completely black legs. Uh, this is a pond-dwelling species, and uh, like most, it's very, it's described as very restless, which I can attest to trying to catch one with a net, which is rather difficult. Um, they don't have a, they, their reputation for um, agile flight is not for nothing, and, aer and aerobatics is not for nothing. Um, but this one has a tendency to um, perch on, have a particular favoured perch, like most darters, uh, unlike the hawkers that uh, get their name from patrolling the air over a pond, for example, the darters tend to return return to um, the same uh, perch repeatedly uh, when they see some tasty creature fly by, some potential prey item, they'll fly out, grab it and go back to their favourite perch. The common darts are unlike a lot of them, will sometimes also um, sit, sit on the ground which makes it quite a, a relatively easy animal to approach, particularly if it's uh, near a path. But this is again another uh, species that's very common across almost the whole of uh, almost the whole of Britain, uh, but a very much smaller animal. I'll just um, the wingspan is barely two centimeters for uh, for this animal. Let me check. With practice, I'll become a slicker presenter. Yeah, 25 to 30 millimetre wingspan for the, uh, the common data. Now these are, this is the end of my example, so if anyone has any questions or any photographs they would like to share, I would be delighted. Olivia, did you want to share your photos? Yeah, I'm just trying to see if I can, I can send it to myself so then I can share the screen with you so it's easier to see. I think that's, I'll stop sharing my screen now. Yeah, that's cool. Or um, if you just have them on a phone, you can just hold it to the camera. I think we tried that last time with the wildflowers. It sort of worked, I feel like, yeah. yeah. Sort of uh, if um, you want to, if there's, I've got, go on, go on. If it, ah, Kat's joined us. Uh, uh, carry on, Olivia. Right, hold on, let me share. I think it's, I think it's the common data. <laughs> it may well be. Um, Let me see it. Ah, right. In fact, you no. might have done me a very. You might have just done me a very, a very nice favour, Olivia, because that is the other species, other similar species I referred to. Ah. <laughs> so, um, this I'm pretty confident is a ruddy data. Oh, cool. Um, so, which is almost as widespread. Uh, the main thing I'm going on is that the common data you may have well noticed in the photographs has got um, an abdomen with, the, with, a, with a pretty constant width all the way down. Um, but the ruddy data has got a slightly pinched waist, which is uh, quite unusual. Uh, the other thing is the legs are almost entirely black, uh, which they, it's not necessarily obvious um, if we had the two photographs side by side, it might be more obvious, but the legs are almost entirely black. And the, um, and the thorax is a bit darker as well. Uh, common yeah, darters great. have got um, pale bands on their thorax. Yeah. Is this the photo you've taken, Olivia? Yeah. From close to you, where you live? Uh, no, I took this when I was in Spurn. Cool. 
good photo. Thank you. That's a very, very nice photograph. Uh, again, this is a, a pond breeder. Um, I, it's one that I, two species that I like to separate quite quickly because at uh, the, uh, the Field Studies Council Centre at Preston Montford, where I uh, learned, started to learn dragonflies, uh, both the common and ruddy darters are very common around their uh, around their pond, or one of their ponds. So you uh, learn to tell them apart quite quickly. Ooh. Should I stop? stop I just like to point out that I think the years, as in over twenty years, <laughs> I thought. They were dragonflies, and I actually think I've been seeing damselflies. Is What's this a common thing? Because I feel like there's a blue one that I've been seeing a lot, and it's just all blue. I don't believe it's your. Um, was it common hawker that you would that you'd brought up on screen? I don't think it's that. I want to say it's the azure. Oh, was it the azure? Azure damselfly, and but common blues look quite similar and then there's well it's most likely one of those two then there's quite a lot of other not uh, quite closely related blue damselflies that look quite similar but are much more restricted in range so and aren't as abundant so maybe i've been seeing damselflies when i think mm. i've been seeing dragonflies possibly yes shall i um, wait a minute if i can get up the right website i think i've been thinking that for years <laughs> I think I've been thinking that <laughs> Did I miss the beginning bit? Did you explain how you can tell the difference? Is there a difference? Yeah, I think, Lawrence, don't get me wrong, this is going to be a test now to see if I was listening. Um, I feel like it was to do with the eyes. So if the eyes are um, further apart, they're dragonflies. Is that uh, right? Is it the other way around? Other way, other way around. Wait, I'll get my, uh, my comparison. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. So if the eyes are further apart, they're damselflies. And if the yes. eyes are closer together, they're dragonflies. So yeah, I've got my... Uh... There we go. Yeah. Here's, my, here's the uh, comparison slide again. Yeah. So, um, just... Uh, I'll, I'll, so... The, I mean, the way that, I mean, it's not a ter terribly scientific thing to say, but the way that I tend to tell them apart, my first thought is basically how heavily built is the insect, because um, I suppose it's more difficult when they're not side by side like this, but dragonflies are quite bulky insects and damselflies are rather more lightly built. But yeah, the uh, another quite important thing is that, and I should have mentioned this earlier really, in comparison to the width of the thorax, the um, where are we? Um, the uh, abdomen of a damselfly is much narrower than the abdomen of a dragonfly. Um, damselflies are uh, okay. All, all, all things they're um, slighter creatures, so they tend to have a slightly um, proportionally to their length, narrower uh, thorax and narrower abdomen. Um, they also tend to be considered to be less strong flyers, which is probably down to the fact that the wings are powered by some very large muscles inside the thorax. And obviously the thorax is smaller relative to the body, size of the body on a, dam on a damselfly. So therefore, relative to body size, they're not going to have the same kind of power as a dragonfly. Um, but yes, if it looks broadly like this, this is uh, looking at, looking at the second segment, it looks like it's an azure blue rather than a common blue. Um, if it looks broadly like this, okay, oh, and the other thing is, yes, as you mentioned about as you said, the, the eyes, uh, they're separated on a damselfly, but they tend to meet at the top of the head on a dragonfly, almost without exception. And uh, the, other, what, the other thing to look out for is if um, 
the animal's perch, it will, um, a dragonfly almost universally, almost universally dragonflies sit with their wings outstretched and damselflies usually sit with their wings closed. So generally if you see an insect sitting with, a, or a daunted sitting with its wings outstretched like this, it's almost certainly a, a dragonfly. If it sits with its wings closed like this, it's almost certainly going to be a damselfly. Yes, so um, now then, um, were there any other questions, by the way? I guess what, what, well, I don't know if this, if they come out all at the same time or what should I be looking out for in the next few weeks? Like what, which ones are the earlier ones? Okay, so, well, I've just, according to the British Dragonfly Society website that I just uh, looked at, they've already started um, sightings of uh, not this species, but the uh, other demoiselle, the uh, Glopterix virgo, the, the beautiful demoiselle, is already out. Uh, most of the records, I have to admit, though, looking at the British Dragonfly Society, again, that have been uploaded to the British Dragonfly Society website, have mostly been in southern England at the moment. So I would guess that their spring's already advanced enough for them to come out. But these are sometimes out before the end of April, although they're not out here yet. So um, for those of you up in Yorkshire, I think it might be a little while. <laughs> but over the next few weeks, I quite deliberately, when I was putting this together, I chose species that are going to be out soon. So these will be out within the next few weeks. Uh, again, the azure damselfly and other blues should, like this, should be out by the end of this month. Uh, similarly for the large red, will be um, out by um, by the end of May. Uh, the southern hawker, if you're anywhere near a pond, a sort of well-vegetated pond, uh, will be on the wing. Uh, its sort of peak season is June and July, and that's actually true for generally true for most dragonflies. Their peak season, most dragonflies and damselflies in Britain, their peak season is June and July. And this will also be true for the common data, which uh, will be out and about by, should be out and about by June. Again, peak season, June, July into August. So, by the way, Olivia, what time of year did you take the uh, photo? It was in September. Yeah, a lot I Yeah. Or potentially like late August. It was it was that kind of time. Mm -hmm. Spurned, that's um I might be showing I might be able to show some geographic ignorance, Hampshire or No uh, Spurns East Yorkshire, it's like right the little the little tip that comes off the the UK. <laughs> It oh. has a, a little point. It's that. Oh, what? Just north, north of Humber Estuary? Potentially. I'm not really sure, to be mm. honest. I'll tell you what. But I know it's on the coast. I do what I was thinking. I was thinking of Hurst Spit, which is, uh, which is in Hampshire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah, well, it was um, very sunny mm -hmm. still. It was really warm when we were there, so... I think Spurn's got a big new visitor centre, hasn't it? Mm, yeah. Yeah. I haven't been yet. I need to go. <laughs> so, um, these are... Uh, they, these are going to be out... Most of these have got quite long flight seasons. So, they'll be emerging um, from... Well, some of them will be... In, certainly, uh, some species uh, are already emerging. There's quite a number of... Uh, Damselflies, uh, I noticed on the uh, um, uh, that are being recorded. As again, um, damselflies often have earlier flight seasons than dragonflies, but there's big overlap. So, possibly more damselflies, possibly we we'll like to see more damselflies earlier in the season than more dragonflies uh, into September, because uh, these, particularly these darters, like the common darter and the ready darter 
are likely to be on the wing well into September. I saw a Southern Hawker in uh, in November last year. Uh, still on the wing in uh, one of our local nature reserves. Which uh, was a wonderful thing to see that late in the year. In terms of numbers, are they are there any which are sort of um, in danger or vulnerable in terms of um, sort of wildlife statistics? Do you know? There are quite a lot of species that breed in Britain. I mean, globally, of course, it's the same. It would be the same old. It's the same old story of. Uh, um, species with restricted habitats that are being cleared having problems. Um, specifically in Britain, which of course I think we, we all, it's easy to forget and we all often do forget, is the worst, well, among the worst offenders for biodiversity loss, if not. Um, we have got a lot of species, quite a number of species that are very restricted in their habitats. So like I mentioned the uh, small red damselfly that uh, essentially brings acid pools and if for whatever reason those pools get drained or um, that environment gets removed in some other way then it's going to struggle because it will have lost breeding habitat and that's that really and uh, there is some concern around some of the more restricted species not that they're necessarily in immediate danger of going locally extinct but that they could eat it wouldn't take much of a change in land use practice in a few areas to make them uh, threatened so like um there's um, some uh, wonderful species called the uh, white leg damselfly which is a um, it's quite um restricted in where it can breed because it prefers breeding in muddy slow flowing rivers and it tends to hunt over pasture land and there aren't all that many places now where there are muddy slow flowing rivers adjacent to pasture land which is basically what it needs uh, there are again the reason I've, i have seen it i've seen it and the reason that i've seen it is that i happen to live near a muddy slow flowing river flowing through pasture land which is wonderful but nationally it is in a few problems because that's not a a set of environments that occurs together very much. Not anymore at any rate. And uh, there's a number of others that have got that kind of uh, issue. Has anyone else got any questions for Lawrence? No? Would anyone else like to add anything? Um, I was just going to ask, I've done quite a lot of pond dipping with the kids at the Trust and we do get quite a lot of damselfly nymphs. Um, but they, they, I mean, they're tiny. Do they, so do they grow to basically adult size in the water? Yeah, absolutely. So they'll grow pretty much the size of the adult. Then they will, once they've reached that, the, sort of the requisite size, and if the conditions are about right, so they tend to be triggered to, so a, a warm few days will trigger them to leave the water, for example. They'll climb out onto vegetation, shed the larval skin, and um, emerge as an adult. So, yeah, they, they, I mean, of course, it must be remembered that some, Dragonflies and damselflies are quite small, but yes, exactly. They part of the reason that you probably wouldn't be taking out pond dipping a fully grown nymph is that once they've got to that full size, early one spring or summer, they will then pretty quickly leave the water. Right. So you're probably only taking out young nymphs. Yeah. Mm. But yes, they will grow to um, essentially adult size before they leave the water. Anybody else or any thoughts? 